you welcome to season four of art, art mantrams art cafe we're delighted to have you all here we are 32 people here and since we're recording this many 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 people are going to view this and experience what our amazing storytellers are going to tell us today so to tell you a little about the writer's table literary mantram we started in October 2020 because we were all sitting at home and saying, what are we going to do with our life? Boring. We have to grow, we have to develop, nothing is happening here. And then this bright young girl, Yumna, started this group and all of us jumped on in this group and we started writing. We started writing like we've never written before. You know, all of us were closet writers. Closet writers means people who hide in the cupboard and write and tell no one about it. But what happened when we got a group like this is all of us began to share our writing. And we are the nicest writers you can see because we only praise each other. All of us are over the moon with each other's writing. We love each other's writing. We love the way our people have grown and evolved. And over the last, over a year now, we've transcended genders. Sorry, we've transcended genres. We've transcended borders. People like people like me who've only written prose have started writing poetry. People like Shaji, who's only written poetry, has started writing prose, and he's going to be presenting today. So many of us have got experimental, and we're so thrilled with the outcome because fundamentally there are words in our head. We just needed to rearrange them in a different way, and we learned to do that because we had such an amazing group of people here to, to, to cheer us on and say that we're good at what we do. So We've also, over, the, over time, we also learned to critique each other. Like, I know that if I write something, I'll probably get a message from Purubi saying, Rukmini, can you consider looking at it from another point of view? Can you consider changing this word? Or I'll get a message from Anil saying, do you think you can look at it from another perspective? You know, it's so nice. You become like family, the language of, 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 of uh, poetry is the language of the heart. And all of us connected from the level of the heart. And right now, we not just protect each other, but we also inspire and make a difference to each other's lives. So that's about literary mantra, uh, uh, writer's table, literary mantra. Yes. Yeah, I, I want a second. I'll just have to mute for a second. Yeah. So now to give you um, some rules about uh, some guidelines about how we're moving ahead. What I'll do is I'll give you a short introduction to each of our writers. They're written little, little, very sweet short stories and essays that they will present to you like traditional narrators, like traditional storytellers. After each story, we will give you some time to write your comments on chat. So I earnestly request everybody here to write something on the chat group because we don't have the time for all of us to actually come on and share our feedback uh, live. So whatever you think, you will get about 30, 30 seconds to write your feedback on chat. And then I will move on to the next storyteller. And by the end of it all, if we still have time, I will open the floor for live feedback from all of you. Does that work? So please okay. keep your fingers ready. They have about eight minutes each. Please keep your fingertips ready on, on the edge of your keyboard so that you give your feedback. The writers would love to hear what you say. Yes? Okay, now we're going to move on to our first storyteller, our first storyteller, Shaji. Uh, Shaji is a jeweler who's retired from business and lives a dream life today. He enjoys music, sings, plays the guitar, loves traveling, reading, and he writes fantastic poetry. He's a prolific poet and writes one poem a day. Who writes one poem a day? Shaji and I writes one poem a day. He also asked me to say, he's, he's a family man. He also asked me to tell you that he's husband to a beautiful wife who's his best friend and father of two lovely daughters and grandfather to three grandsons who are the light of his life. So that's Shaji Naya. And the name of the story is The Calling. So Shaji, I'm going to spotlight you. Yeah, thank you. The Calling an abridged version to fit the time frame. A January morning welcomed my friend Anand and I as we landed in Delhi. From the warm and humid embrace of God's own country, the capital was like the cold kiss of the Winter Queen. I had launched a new company and we needed to find outlets of distribution in the city. 
The morning meetings were tedious but encouraging. My local contact, Mr. Mukesh, inquired if I was adventurous enough to try lunch at the local Dhaba. I took up the challenge. A walk through the crowded and winding streets of Chantani Chowk, Jahanara's once glorious moonlight square in Old Delhi is an experience that you can never forget. The smell of food and people makes to give you the odor of the land. After resting for a while, after lunch, Mr. Mukesh took us to the Jama Masjid area to meet a leading businessman in this new line of my business. The masjid was built by Shah Jahan, a name my father used to call me lovingly, I mused. Though he passed on at the young age of 47, some two score years ago, I sometimes stop what I'm doing to hear him call me Shah Jahan. We carry a part of those whom we love to help mitigate the pain of parting, I guess. The weather had turned cold and winter dusk rushed in early. The call for prayer from the mosque seemed to stir some dormant spiritual awakening. As we were walking, I distinctly heard someone call Shah Jahan. The voice was familiar, the gender unclear. Was it a thought or a voice? I was not sure. For some reason, I could not take another step. Now both my companions were worried that I was ill. I knew there was another explanation here. Here were forces at work beyond my control. I turned and walked into the first shop on the side street. My friends followed. It was an old shop that sold used brass items by weight, nothing out of the ordinary. The shopkeeper, a young man, was eager to be of service. Can I help G? He asked in Hindi, a language that I was not fluent in. Madat in Hindi, I knew, was help. I just gave him the famous Indian nod. It could mean anything. Yes, no, or I don't know. The further to the south of India you belong, the harder and at random we shake our head. I did not know why I was there. I turned to Mr. Mukesh and said, Mukesh ji, I need some help here. Can you ask him if anyone called out Shah Jahan? Now, from the corner of my eyes, I saw my friends look at each other totally puzzled. An elderly man came from inside the store and introduced himself. He was the owner of the business and the young man, he proudly told me was his beta, his son. Every Indian businessman prays for a son to take over his business. His prayers had been answered. I sat down on an wooden chair that he offered and told him about the calling I had experienced. He listened attentively. Cool water was served to the three of us. In the north of India, there is a tradition. In the olden days, water and jaggery were served to visitors who had come after a long and tiring journey. Soon, glasses of hot masala chai appeared. For some time, we talked of meditation, existence in dual dimension, soul migration, and astral travel. Abruptly, all conversation ceased. Both have had nothing more to say. He invited me to his home. The store extended to his living quarters. After removing my footwear, I stepped into his library. A well-lit room with old furniture. Against the wall stood a million glass cabinet made of shisham wood. It showed signs of age. These are my personal collection, he declared, and not for sale. I nodded my head in understanding. Then time stood still. I think I heard some music. There was a certain rhythm to it. Was I experiencing what has historically been called an epiphany? It was the answer I knew with a certainty I had never felt before. My rebellious mind, for the first time, took a backseat somewhere, so far away 
that I could not hear the mocking voice. There she was, the source of my call. She was so beautiful and enchanting that my eyes filled with tears. I tried hard to stifle a sob. Through my tears, I saw her smile. Everything and everyone disappeared. There were only the two of us, Devi Parvati and me. The exquisite idol of the goddess had been cast in the Himalayan region. In the ancient version, the upper torso is unclad. Her silver inlaid jewelry took on a mesmerizing shine. Her face had the fine detailing wrought by the hands of some blessed craftsman she had smiled upon. The golden patina robes and the silver jewelry radiated peace and tranquility. Her left hand was placed firmly on Mother Earth, connecting her to the earthly plane, a symbol of total loveliness. She understood every thought generated in all the seven worlds and beyond. Today, she was here just for me, her Shah Jahan. I stood with folded hands, I felt blessed. I heard myself ask, can I take her home? The owner of the house looked shocked. He had been in his family for a hundred years. Maaf Kieji, he said in a voice lightly raised. I knew with this, our conversation was over. I kept my visiting card on the table and left. I carried her in my heart on my journey home. A week later, I got a call from Mr. Mukesh. The shop owner wants your telephone number, G. Can I give it to him? He lost your card, he said. I agreed. My card, I guess, had found a resting place in the dustbin for sure. That was a start of many calls and a friendship that blossomed. Three months later, she came home. A mother knows when her child needs her. I talk to her and we have these special moments. Time stops when she wants. I offered her flowers. She refused. When my daughter Maitli came home for a visit, I saw instant love in her eyes when she looked at my Parvati. I told her of my experience. Achi, you know why she does not like flowers? She asked. She is like me. My daughter's dislike for fresh flowers had always made me wonder if it was some purva janma karma. I will take her home someday, Achi. I heard my daughter say, Shah Jahan, I heard her call. I smiled. Someday. Thank you. Beautiful, Shadi. Thank you so much. I'm giving you all 30 seconds to just put your comments. And now we move to our next storyteller, Yumna. So Yumna Hari Singh has worked across Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America through her associations with AIESEC participating and leading youth conferences, and later at Gadbury Schweppes, where she worked on policy responding to issues such as obesity. She's a consultant and ethical, ethical auditor for Good Corporation UK. She began her work with the arts in 1999 and is today founding trustee and vice president of Art, the Art Mantram Trust. Yuvna is currently curating the Glasshouse Festival, poetry from around the world. Yuvna writes poetry and short stories and, and has won minor short story writing competitions, including Esprit, and got honorary, honorary mentions at Write India. Okay, she's also the girl with the prettiest smile that I know. Okay. The name of Yumna's story is How I Met Your Mother. Over to you, Yumna. Thank you, Rukmini. Thank you very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share. Um, I hope you all enjoy this story. Um, 
here we go without further ado, how I met your mother. I opened the door and there your mother lay on the doormat. She was beautiful, button nose, arced eyebrows, pursed mouth already pouting at me. I saw this in flashes only, of course, as I stumbled in surprise and shock over her and hit my head on the wall opposite. Not the best first impression. I stared at her for a while after that, intermittently looking around to see if anybody else was going to appear. Her eyelashes lay in quiet repose and when I tentatively nudged her, they didn't flicker. Considering I really had no idea what to do, I decided not to wake her. I rang the doorbells of my neighbors and could hear my heart out competing my knuckle wraps on the door and the faint chimes within. Like the beginning of all good horror stories, it seemed like I was all alone. I gave in to the brutal taskmaster that is the weekly workday and inched my way back to this then unknown female. The obvious next step to my panicking mind was to appeal to higher authority. The entire mess was above my pay grade. I wanted nothing to do with the unconscious beauty, particularly when laid at my feet. To this day, I couldn't tell you how I drove or parked. All I remember clearly is sitting in front of a cop. I peered at the nameplate pinned to his chest and I read the letters and could not recall them a second later. The large khaki man in front of me cleared his throat <clears throat> and frowned. So, made anybody pregnant? The clock ticked thrice. I'm a woman, sir, I responded. That may be so, but nowadays all sort of new things. I have attended gender diversity seminar training. All gays, lesbians and bi's, we are ready to serve. Local police, at your service. I blinked back at him. Soft breathing emanated from the right of me. My bosom was outstretched in front of me and I double checked that it was there before unconsciously thrusting it in his direction. What do you think these are? His large plush facial hair reflected the light from both the window and the fluorescent tube above. His nostrils quivered as his voice scolded me. Madam, you want to be giving complaint? You can do so. No crude and offensive insinuations, please. And he flicked his chin at the wall to the right. I kept my chin up as I read. All our employees have the right to a safe workspace. Sexual and physical harassment will be prosecuted with either a fine of rupees 500 and or up to six years in prison. When I remember him now, he emerges as though from a mist, 60 something, frown lines etched deep between handsome thick eyebrows, round pom pom mustaches embellishing both cheeks. I can now clearly remember his name etched on blue plate K.C. Gowda. My finger pointed between the board and myself. I'm sorry, but you think, Madam, he responded, flicking a head from the top of my head downwards and back with a dubious tone. Madam, if you speak crudely to myself, you can be liable to sexual harassment charges. Please to be keeping these matters outside the workspace unless it pertains to your business in my office here now. I am trying to understand what's happening here. You have come with a strange complaint. I am now seeking to establish a pattern of behavior. Perhaps you harassed your lover and she could not bear it anymore. And she has fled from you into destitution. And because you have besmirched her honor, she cannot go to her family. And so will have to resort to illegal activities to support her infant. And since she is wanting to be a good ma, she has instead made you take responsibility by leaving the baby in front of your door. And then he squinted at me and tilted his head like a curious crow. The door boy bustled in with milky smelling chai. The fan creaked metronomically above my head. I sought to make sense of what was happening. Yes, he asked, seeking my verification for his hypothesis. No, I shouted, no, it's not my baby. I have no paramour. I'm asking you to find the baby's parents and set the situation right. Hmm, came his dissatisfied response as he rocked back and forth. I was getting dizzy again. Finally, he pulled his paperwork towards himself and said, Sorry, madam, today is Mahila Divas. All women constables are on duty at official function, so you have to keep the baby. 
social services. I snapped my fingers at him. Women and child ministry. Surely someone there can take charge of the baby. One of his mustached, wing-cheeked, raised itself at me in a smirk. His belly pressed into the front of his desk as he ran a finger down a type sheet under the glass. As he dialed the landline phone and clicked his abnormally long pinky fingernail, I noticed pictures of Ganesha and Sai Baba and Mother Mary next to each other. He handed the receiver to me, dangling from the first knuckle of his index finger. It swung to and fro and I knew from his expression that it would do me no favors. Sure enough, a recorded voice informed me imperiously that the number was busy. How about this? I suggested. I leave the baby with you and you hand it over to the right people. Mahila constables when they come. I cajoled him with my eyebrows, beseeched him with my eyes. Finger guns went off in response accompanied by no can do madam. My constant fear that the sleeping beauty would awaken gnawed at me. I girded my sari and picked up the basketed person and thought next stop orphanage. And madam, he said as I walked out, I looked over my shoulder to see him waving the form with all my personal details at me. If that baby Missy found anywhere, you will be liable for reckless endangerment and child abandonment. I said a word here you probably shouldn't hear. I left and wandered up and down the street. I opened my car door and plonked the basket down to have my eyes finally catch on hers. She blinked long, long lashes at me and I was gone. One week later, I was back at the police station agreeing with all Sri Casey Gowda's wild hypothesis. Yes, yes, I had baby with my paramour and now she has run away leaving me all alone with the baby. I have no paperwork, but this is in fact my baby. Please help me get paperwork in order. I knew it, shrieked Gowda in jubilation. That's it. Thank you. Rukmini said, write comedy. I've never written comedy before, so there you go. Brilliant. 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 Absolutely brilliant. 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 You all have 30 seconds. You all have 30 seconds. Yeah. You post your comments. No suggestions coming from my home for this. Humpy, I'm looking for you. Where are you? Oh, there you are. This is Dr. Humpy Chakravarti. She's our resident intellectual in the group. She lives in Jharkhand. Yeah, I wanted to mention Shaji lives in uh, Kanyakumari. Uh, Humpy lives in Jharkhand and she studied at BHU. So Dr. Champi Chakrabarti writes content for a living and studies, studies lives to find content. A research, researcher in autobiographies, she writes about her raw journey on the spiritual path. The essay she's presenting today has previously been published in the Commonwealth Writers website. The name of her essay is A Peanut Battles the New World Existential Crisis. Go for it, Punk. Uh, Humpy, with a name like that, we just can't wait. Thank you so much, Rukmini Ji, and thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And of course, uh, Shaji and Yamna have uh, put the benchmark so high <laughs> that now I'm a little shaky. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, this piece was written during the very first lockdown. So the situation is we are all locked down for the first time in our lives, probably. A peanut battles the new world existential crisis. Why peanut? The association dates back to three decades before COVID-19. On, on the sultry evenings after my father came back from his office at exactly 5 p.m., he would take my mother and the little me out to the hilltop behind our house in our little town of Ranchi in India. Once there, I was usually encouraged to run around by myself while my parents sat and caught up on what my generation likes to call the quality time. In the world, before news feeds were in existence, 
what accompanied their quality time was the sunset and peanuts. These peanuts were roasted over sand with their shell on and you were required to invest time and energy and attention to break open the shells and get to the peanut. The push carts below the hill selling those peanuts wrapped in old newspapers would market them with the endearing nickname, Time Pass. Time Pass, Time Pass, Time Pass, five rupees a packet. Peanuts thus became my metaphor for unhurried quality time. The kind of time I had assumed I would be entitled to when the world entered this lockdown. I was so wrong. The only thing I could give a miss owing to working from home was that I could skip dressing myself below the screen level. And of course, there was no commute to work. Rather, plentiful other things got added to my to-dos. This included elaborate planning to cook so that I do not starve multiple times a day, mopping and dusting my own universe, mowing my own outgrowth, and strategizing on NASA level to acquire grocery. The monster of it all, however, was the pressure to be an apostle of positivity and productivity. Interestingly, it turns out that all your efforts towards filling your days and nights with productivity and positivity was quite irrelevant on its own merit. The relevance came about only when your pursuit of the aforementioned piece had been made available for consumption by all and sundry on a webcast on a social media live, or at least a humble status update post. All of a sudden, every soul seemed riddled with the burden of uplifting humanity, including themselves and their brethren. Come, I will teach you how to write a particular thought, how to grow a rhododendron, how to bake a cake without eggs, milk, gluten, or even an oven, how to meditate, and how to write a song. Oh, I too could have done an Instagram live about how to not give a baboon's back about Instagram lives. But then I bumped into it. That old friend FOMO from pre-COVID days. What if those tiny people in those square and rectangular boxes on the Zoom calls become the only available human reality in the new world? What if hourly content updates become our only signifier in the new world? What if followers on social media become the only qualitative analysis of our worth? If content stays the only king, good God, am I to perish as a pauper? It's like we are constantly and legitimately living two lives, one outside and one inside our screens. And each one of them is as real as the other. And then I wondered, of all things to be a winner at, was I pioneering the novel visage of existential crisis? Let's see. In the new world order, I have been overwhelmed by the amount of online wisdom that has come my way. And I have been feeling significantly threatened for my existence by my sheer lack of initiative or skill in the wisdom market. The outpouring of creativity and enthusiastic ingenuity by friends who until the day before lockdown hadn't cared to switch off the lights when they left the room, has been wrecking havoc with my understanding of life as I sit here eating fruits for breakfast, boiled vegetables for lunch, and a glass of milk for dinner. On receiving an invite to join a friend's Instagram live to celebrate the roaring success of her makeup tutorial videos, I took a pensive look at the hair on my limbs that had finally stopped growing any longer after attaining a certain length. My neighbor too had posted two dance videos that got more than 500 views and 300 likes within the time that I took to stand and stare at the blooming white hibiscus on my balcony. On my part, I only managed to post on social media on the days I dust underneath my bed, which as you understand is not so frequent. In my defense, I did undertake a few amazing journey within the pages of a few books and watched many a sunrise from my window. With clearer air, I watched the sky every night as the count of visible stars went up. I watered my peace lily and stood in rapture 
as the white flower made its journey into existence, unwrapping its maiden bounty at a divine pace undetected by naked eyes. I had long conversations with a few loved ones. None of it was captured on my sizzling screens. Neither did it make its way to the news feeds of my tribe. So tell me, how does a peanut exist in this world of like, comment, and subscribe? Thank you. Lovely, lovely Hampi, very good. Enjoyed yeah, it, Hampi. enjoyed it. Stunning, stunning Hampi. The spirit. You have 30 seconds to post your comments. for Devyani. Is Devyani here? Yeah. I'm here. Can you? I am why am I not able to find it if any okay. it says Devyani's Galaxy Note 8. Devyani's Galaxy Note 8. Oh there you are. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. So now I'm introducing Devyani. Okay, Dr. Devyani Singh is an editor of an education magazine and is based in Chandigarh. So you see how spread, how widespread our writers are across India. She writes poems and has won several awards for her stories. The story she's presenting today won the second prize at the Chandigarh Literary Society Short Story Competition 2020. The name of the story, interestingly, is Married, not dead. Over to you, Devyani. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Married Not Dead by Dr. Devyani Singh. She often wondered whether time had stopped. Years had elapsed since she'd met him, or so it seemed to her. She tried not to think of the future, but that was all she could think of. As if to dampen her spirits further, he seemed rather aloof on phone calls. Could it be that he had, her thoughts went back to the day they had first met. Married, not dead, said the sign on his t-shirt. She glanced surreptitiously at the ruggedly handsome man in his forties. To her embarrassment, he caught her looking at him. He pulled his t-shirt out from the folds of his pectorals and nonchalantly stretched it out for her to read. Is this all you wanted to see? He smiled, revealing crooked teeth with slightly long canines. His imperfection only added to his charm. I'm Dave, by the way. He stretched out his hand. Well, I'm almost your namesake. Just add four more letters. She managed a weak smile. What kind of four letters? He winked, making her go red in the face. They had just boarded an overnight luxury bus from Delhi to Kulu in Himachal Pradesh. They had traveled for some hours when the bus came to an abrupt halt in the middle of the wilderness. Much to everyone's dismay, the bus driver informed that the headlights had stopped working and they would have to wait until daybreak. Her heart was pounding at this unexpected development. When the bus was on its way, there was some common purpose and they could just sit next to each other and not have to talk. But now, sitting there in the dark silence of the jungle, interspersed with the stridulation of crickets, it seemed like they had to start up a conversation. He suggested they get down and stretch their legs a bit. 
As it was better than sitting in awkward silence and getting bitten by mosquitoes, she agreed. They strolled along the road. It was a moonless night and fireflies danced about, making ethereal patterns in the woods. They could hear the distant howling of wolves and an owl hooted as they passed. You know, I had this t-shirt especially designed as it goes with my philosophy of life. He kicked some stones out of the way with great flourish. Does that mean, even though you're married, you're available for relationships? She queried. Who said anything about relationships? Let's just say I'm available. He raised a single eyebrow. But, but, but doesn't your wife mind? I mean, what if she found out? Won't she be hurt? What about kids? Won't their lives be devastated by a divorce? She stammered. She can't be hurt by what she doesn't know. And I'm not a fool. I will be very careful and ensure she never finds out. She would easily be able to tell if something is amiss. You know, women have a sort of sixth sense. That's my problem, not yours. The only thing amiss here is you. Get it? A miss. You think too much. Look at you. In your thirties, I guess. Pretty, single, but still not wanting to mingle. I haven't met the right man yet. So, you're going to keep waiting for Mr. Perfect. What if he never turns up? Shouldn't you be having a little fun till then? I'm sorry. You may call me old fashioned, but I can't imagine being close to someone I don't love. I'm just not into casual relationships. Do you love your wife? She ventured. Of course I love her, but marriage is like chewing gum that loses its flavor after some time. A man can't eat the same flavor of ice cream all his life, can he? I mean, why do women want to treat men like a uh, cake? You know, you can't have your cake and he trailed off, grinning at his attempt at cheesy humor. Would you let your wife date other guys? Why would she want to date other guys if I keep her happy? Oh, so she would be happy being faithful while you went about gallivanting with all and sundry. You're not even logical. She was beginning to get angry. Maybe men are by nature polygamous and women monogamous, he continued. Everything changes. Change is the only constant. What about the steadfast North Star? What about true love? Just because you don't believe in it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If all men had your philosophy, who would look after kids? Marriage would become a dying institution. I don't want kids. I don't want to get tied down. Maybe we could go, just go back to Plato's idea in the Republic. Do away with the institution of family altogether. Let the state rear the children. That's a ridiculous and impractical idea. How can you be so insensitive? You know what? I'm done arguing with you. She was livid. Not insensitive. I'm just being practical. No one wants any responsibility these days. Everyone wants to be free. We have a right to do what satisfies us. Well then, I'd rather be a Socrates dissatisfied than a big satisfied. She huffed. Beep, beep. Suddenly the bus honked, blasting through the stillness. They hadn't realized how much time they had spent arguing. And it was the first light of dawn already. They got back on the bus and were on their way again. The rest of the trip was spent trying to catch some sleep. She woke with a jerk when she realized she had dozed off with her head on Dave's shoulder. She straightened up, but he placed his palm on the side of her head and put it back. Oh, come now, be comfortable. I'm not going to eat you up. The bus wound its way uphill and they were greeted with one serene view after another. Will you give me your phone number? Maybe we can catch up over dinner sometime. Sorry, but I don't hate married men. She was still peeved. It won't 
Date, I promise. I just like talking to you. You make me think. Oh my, isn't that the beginning of falling in love when a person makes you think? I thought you said I think too much, she said tongue in cheek. He was embarrassed this time, but hid it well. Ha, fat chance. You know, I'm not the soppy kind, he added as a parting shot. From then on, they talked on the phone often and met also. Seasons passed and they grew close till one day he finally declared his love for her. He asked her to give him some time and promised he would get a divorce. He had told her never to call on his phone as he used to call first. But one day, due to his mysterious aloofness, she grew impatient and could not stop herself. She dialed with trembling hands. The phone rang for a long time and then to her shock, a crisp female voice responded. Her heart was in her mouth as the voice scoffed at her. Dave will no longer be calling you. His marriage is not dead yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devian. Delightful. Lovely, lovely, beautiful. You have 30 seconds, 30 seconds to post your comments. What's your comment? Technically, we have one minute before we close the session. But you know, it's so difficult closing the session without having at least one feedback, one two minute feedback from the audience before we say our goodbyes and our thank yous. Would anyone here like to share one one minute comment? Kala is highlighted. Kala, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say it was a very captivating. It was very captivating listening to us. Can you hear me? Oh just about. I was saying it was captivating hearing all, all the stories. I didn't realize how much time has passed. Actually, the stories, uh, Ripni, can I make a small comment? Yes, uh, yes. The stories really bring and bring a lot of areas that, you know, you cannot think of. Like, you know, that it's a everything we have experienced like you know i have that feeling thank you so much for this uh, for this session this session so you know at at mantra we are so good about time starting on time finishing on time so we are 546 uh i'm going to invite lakshmi my good friend and the co-chair of Writer's Table Literary Mantra to come and wind down and see the goodbyes. Lakshmi, over to you. You're muted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Rukmini. That was beautiful. And, uh, uh, you know, you ran it to perfection. Time started on time, we're ending on time. It's beautiful. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to thank each of the four fabulous storytellers of our writer's table for today's rendition. Uh, you know, each of them was beautiful. The, uh, it was well-written, it was well-narrated, and uh, uh, we all were completely, uh, you know, hooked on to their words. So Shaji Nair began with uh, the calling. It was mystical at one level and very personal and intimate at another. But it was a gripping account that we thoroughly enjoyed, Shaji. Thank you for sharing that with us. Beautiful. Yumna Hari Singh. <laughs> it was, you made us smile and laugh. Such an enthralling, humorous and lively account of how I met your mother. It was narrated with flair. And uh, because of your narration, Inspector Gauda just came alive for each one of us. <laughs> Thank you, Yumna. Thank you for that. Dr. Hampi Chakravarti is the peanut. What was it? The peanut tells, battles the new world of existential, new world existential crisis. Uh, I mean, it was so relatable to each one of us. 
because I, I do recall visiting beaches during holidays while growing up and always picking up these peanuts. You know, even today they are my, one of my favorites. But how she seamlessly moved from peanuts to FOMO and social media excesses in today's uh, post-COVID world, it was highly thought-provoking and enjoyable at the same time. Thank you, Humpy, for that. Um, Dr. Devyani Singh's Married Not Dead, very engaging story and very intriguing as well because we all were waiting with bated breath as the story developed. The climax was unexpected and powerful. Thank you, Dr. Devyani, for that. I would also like to thank Dr. Uh, uh, Rukmini Prabhakar for her untiring efforts in putting this afternoon together. Thanks are due to Jija, the founder trustee of uh, Art Mantram, Raji, the president of Art Mantram, for their constant encouragement and support. And Kashmira Elena from the executive committee are here supporting us all the time. Thanks to the audience, of course, for the, being so patient, appreciative, for all the lovely comments that have come in. And, you know, just encouraging us at uh, Writer's Table to keep creating more and more. And thus, we end today's episode of Art Cafe Season 4. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi, Rukmini, Ampi, Yumna, Shadi, and Devyani. Beautiful one, uh, 45 minutes. I don't know what Lakshmi said is so true. We didn't know it just, you know went off in a in the batting of an eyelid sort of a thing really wonderful thank you so much thank you for curating this so well Rukmini and what a lovely audience thanks so much thank you yeah thank you for the to the audience also <laughs> thank you so much bye bye Bye. thanks so much everyone lovely session also, lots, 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 of, lots of comments on the chat. Those who want to stay back and and uh, read the comments are welcome to stay. Can we? Can we? Because can all we lovely comments. Collect lovely. all the comments. Can we um, gather all the comments somehow? I have no idea. How Check now. Be.